All right, welcome everyone to our four o'clock session. Just want to remind everyone, put your phones on stun or vibrate. Um, stay hydrated. It's hydrated. It's hot today, and uh, I know there's no bottled water, so there's water fountains around the corner there. Um, again, if you have any issues, medical or otherwise, uh, look for someone with a radio or a, uh, a staff shirt. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Julia Corona and Alessandro Polidoro, and they have the most creative title of, I think, the, this, the whole day today. Um, porn, flap, porn platforms hate them for exposing their mischief with these two weird tricks. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, thank you. We are uh, Alessandro and Julia. Uh, Alessandro is a lawyer, um, a communication designer, and data analyst. And uh, we are part of this uh, European organization called Tracking Expos, um, who does uh, algorithmic uh, auditing, uh, algorithm accountability, and focus on digital rights. Uh, in this talk, we will present you our research on uh, Pornhub, and uh, we also investigate uh, TikTok uh, and uh, YouTube uh, currently. Uh, so check it out at um, tracking.expose. Uh, what we do, uh, basically we, um, we analyze platforms, uh, not people. Uh, we want to collect data to understand the proprietary algorithms uh, for public interest. Um, in this example, uh, we use the Pornhub Tracking Expose uh, browser extension. And uh, the idea is that uh, platforms can conceptualize uh, gender and other social constructs um, and can verify conceptions about it and uh, can shape, uh, affect, maintain uh, status quo and gender identities. So why porn and why Pornhub? Porn because uh, we can consider internet as a pornographic technology if we think about uh, food porn or how they uh, are made now to, uh, mm, let's say, uh, get your attention visually and uh, stimulate your gaze. Why Pornhub? Pornhub because it's uh, the first and the biggest uh, of the pornographic platforms uh, yet at the moment. Um, it is a platform because first uh, there is identification of the user. Um, they have uh, content and that is standardized based on popularity and predictability. And they also have uh, uh, targeted content and ads. Third, they have this uh, data porn, so they use uh, their blog uh, year in review uh, as a, a communication strategy and um, form of advertising because they claim this is a transparency um, tool, but actually they decide what to tell you and what data they can share and what data they cannot. So. We know that uh, algorithms are black boxes and uh, there is uh, no knowledge about uh, how a uh, fair and unbiased algorithm should look like. We don't even know if it is possible. We know that automated um, surveillance is something related with the uh, conservatives, but now, uh, we give it for granted and we just think that it's biased and there is a universal truth, but uh, we are not sure about it. And uh, we cannot think about a different uh, world, a different uh, alternative uh, to this uh, system and to surveillance capitalism. So what we do, uh, we do scrapism, is web scraping, but for uh, artistic, emotional, or critical ends, this is what uh, Sam Lavigne says, so we uh, find ourselves in this. We have uh, HTML websites and pages 
with non-structured data all nested around and uh, we created this uh, extension to extract, uh, parse them and do scraping. Then we have a structured uh, JSON or CSV that we can analyze and uh, compare to also document what's happening with the platform. Um, our methodology for this paper was actually considering uh, uh, one sexual interest over the three uh, Pornhub allows us to have, so we can be interested in girls and guys or girls and guys, but then we can uh, have different gender, gender identities. This is all in the um, registration process. So there are 10 gender identities and we had, uh, we, mm, decided to focus on 10 accounts. Uh, uh, we got like uh, 1,600 uh, on pages and there were like 46 uh, videos per on page. But we understood that the unique videos were m far away less, uh, 118 uh, for this study. Uh, how does it look like? This is one video, uh, one entry for one video on the on page. So we have uh, different metadata. Uh, title, author name, author link, uh, and the size, whatever. We focused on section name because we wanted to analyze the home page from a section point of view because there were there are different uh, sections, as you may know, or not. I don't know. Uh, now I will show you how personalization can look like from uh, from a visualization point of view. And the graphs were made with uh, the open source tool Gephi, so check it out. And this is how content that is not personalized look like, looks like. Uh, we have the 10 uh, triangles here that are um, our, mm, our accounts we created, and the videos uh, in the middle, so shared by everyone. And this, were, this was the case for hot horn videos in your country, most viewed videos in, in your country, so uh, geographical personalization. Uh, um, our bots were uh, all from the same country, so that's why you see it like this, and recently featured uh, videos uh, as well. But what happens when you give a look to another section, like recommended category for you, that is different uh, and it can also not be present for uh, different gender identities. So we just got uh, it uh, in uh, six uh, accounts, and uh, we can start to see um, that there are uh, proto clusters, so um, some accounts that share a lot of videos and others that uh, don't. Um, in the last and in uh, the individualized uh, personalization in the recommended for you category, so for you uh, section, sorry, um, we can see two different clusters and they are really uh, well defined. So we found, uh, found out that there was a heteronormative cluster, so male and female together um, in a more standard um, cluster because they were they were sharing like a lot, and then there was another cluster, but always depending on on the um, on the male one, um, that is uh, less uh, heteronormative, but it puts all together, and uh, is the case of trans men, non-binary, same-sex uh, couple, so female, so lesbian and trans woman. Um, the curious thing is that uh, in the gender normative, we had the models, channel, and porn stars. But in the other, we were not able to find channels and so production companies that are uh, por mm, Pornhub's property uh, as well. So this uh, was a little bit uh, uh, tricky. We don't. We still don't know how to give a meaning to this. Um, but basically, our main argument is that uh, the platform 
uh, and the algorithmic suggestions were uh, fostering a heteronormative perspective on sexual desire and uh, they were typical of a heterosexual white and hegemonic masculinity. So what comes next uh, to this? Um, we would like to raise awareness about uh, topics like the GDPR, like we are doing here, I don't know, uh, alg algorithms, uh, consent, and especially desire. Um, we would like to hold more the platform accountable for the lack of transparency uh, with the respect of the tracking. So um, we also, decided to proceed in a different way and uh, to give a better look at uh, um, cash and uh, cookies. And then we would like to do some more call for action uh, through our tools. So the next step was actually to create this uh, uh, new software called Guardoni because uh, we um, understood that gaining data from uh, volunteers is, is great to have an empirical first uh, um, example of what's happening and some anecdotal evidences, uh, but then to prove them and to say, okay, we saw them. We need to have a, a clean environment and uh, a sort uh, of a clean setup. Uh, even a small uh, browser history can buy us everything. So what are we now looking for? We are looking for third party trackers and uh, how they relate to recommended content and basically, okay, porn and how it, uh, how it works, uh, how the rabbit hole can be, um, can make people <laughs> become more uh, sadistic or, or stuff like that. Um, so this tool is, uh, is available on GitHub and uh, you can find it uh, in the methodology uh, directory. Um, what can it do for us? So uh, it's a laboratory setup. Um, it can help us installing the, uh, the extension on a clean browser because it's directly installed. Um, it initialize a new uh, Chromium, in this case, profile. Um, a new user dat data uh, directory. Um, it can automatically navigate uh, through the website and, uh, and gain uh, some tracking data and uh, screenshots. Um, we can have a look at the, at the code. Uh, it's basically a node library with uh, JavaScript extensions and um, the APIs are, are, are quite uh, simple. You can uh, launch the browser, uh, wait, uh, go to uh, a precise URL, take a screenshot, and then close it. This is a simple example, but an experiment uh, that we do can be uh, exactly looking uh, like this. Um, the experiment is a set of comments. Uh, we create a JSON with a, a list of URL we want to access and uh, for uh, how much time, uh, if we want a screenshot, it's all defined in a, in a JSON. You can create it with a GIST on GitHub. And uh, when you give it to, the, to Guardoni, Guardoni automa automatically um, navigates uh, through these uh, comments and uh, instructions. The other thing we are doing is to collect uh, the cookies in the local storage. Local storage is, is a cache, again, um, on your browser. It, it is different uh, from a web storage uh, of cookies because it's uh, permanent. You have to, uh, uh, the, the cookies don't expire. So um, as you can see, we, we collect uh, the cookies, but also, um, we are um, creating a sort of white list of uh, the domain pornab.com and pornab and cdn, um, dot com. Uh, so we know it's, uh, it's their cookies and okay. But then we are also extracting the third party cook, uh, trackers and um, yeah, parse the, the domain. So we can know who is uh, behind uh, these cookies because 
um, in the porn industry, um, online there was a, a bubble and uh, no one wanted to uh, advertise on, on porn uh, platforms. Uh, so basically there is a, a different, uh, a different uh, market and uh, a parallel ecosystem um, of third party service providers and we would like to know more because uh, it has not been scrutinized yet but by um, regulators or um, research community, academics and policy makers. And um, now Alessandro will talk to you more about the legal perspe perspective. Uh, Thank, you. What we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Can you hear, hear me? All right. Uh, so yeah. Uh, hello. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Julia, for the presentation of our tools and the research we have done with uh, tracking exposed in the past years. So yeah. Uh, basically. Uh, uh, my role here, uh, role here as a as a lawyer, is to try and answer uh, to the following question. So, how did we get here? How uh, how did it happen that um, such a huge and invasive uh, market that deals with an incredibly sensitive aspect of our culture, of our society, uh, uh, how did it happen that this market is basically growing unregulated, unsupervised, and uh, sometimes even uh, just uh, being a mockery of actually of the principles that should uh, inform the, the the digital sphere we've seen that uh, especially when we investigated Pornhub we realized that on one end we have a, a official and formal uh, statement of acknowledging different gender orientation different sexual preferences uh, with the nine uh, possible categories or uh, of sexual orientation that a user is allowed to uh, uh, express uh, to the platform before uh, navigating it. But in fact, the algorithm is biased in, a, in the sense that basically gives you either uh, straight heteronormative con uh, content recommendation or the weird <laughs> content recommendation, you know. Um, is this even legal? <laughs> How does it work, right? This is the, 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 the the starting point of what I'd like to discuss with you today. Um, and the answer is not uh, that simple. And this is especially because of this word that you see right here, this uh, legal vacuum, a uh, concept that uh, may be not too familiar for uh, most of you. For, uh, uh, legal, for, for us legal people dealing with the digital world, it's actually the, the, the norm. <laughs> it's our everyday life. Is this a legal context in which things are not clear, there is no applicable law or in which some injustice in un is uncorrected. Uh, this has been for a very long time, the, as I said, the general norm for the digital world. We are slowly trying to fill up the void, to uh, put new solutions, new ideas into this vacuum. Uh, of course, uh, I, I can speak for the European uh, legal uh, context, and many, many step forwards have been done, but in the US it's the same. Uh, I think, for instance, that all the new acts uh, that uh, came out in California with the um, California Consumer Privacy Act and the California Privacy Rights Act, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah. We are slowly, and slowly has a double meaning in this context because it's the usual slowness of the legal world and also the, the fact that the digital world is by nature very, very fast compared to the other things of the world. We, we see it every day. And, and so uh, when you think of the fact, for instance, uh, Julia mentioned GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Leg Regulation. Uh, in, in, it's in force in Europe since 2018. Well, it took 20 years to, to, to come up uh, with that, because the, the, the law that was existing before that was from 1995, and, um, and yeah, you see, I will talk more about it in the upcoming slides, but I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is to give you the, the, the feeling of uh, the, the, the different uh, uh, pace, different speed uh, that, uh, that you can experience in the digital world and in the legal world uh, compared. 
So about this legal vacuum, uh, legal vacuum is a, it, it's a catch-all term. We can actually divide it uh, a little bit more and, and try to understand it, uh, and understand it a little bit more. Of course, it's the lack of norms in general. Uh, it's, that's quite intuitive. But um, in, in this case, um, we can think of it at every level, every kind of norm. So it can either be actual law, like so, uh, international conventions or national law, uh, you name it, uh, or also other kind of rules, other kind of norms. Uh, let's think of internal policies of these platforms. I mean, uh, maybe we don't even have to talk about these <laughs> problems if only the pornographic platforms were to have uh, decent policies of uh, content moderation and data um, uh, and protection of personal data of their users, but. Uh, it here we are, so apparently something didn't work out as planned. And um, the problem is that uh, that's not even the only uh, thing that we're lacking right here, because uh, lack of concept is also uh, a, a huge component of this legal vacuum. Because um, you see, um, there is, um, so lawmakers are basically people. <laughs> and we are people too, so we can somehow imagine to be <laughs> lawmakers ourselves. And if, if, we, if we try and imagine ourselves uh, having to create new rules for the digital world, especially when it comes to the pornographic uh, world, uh, we actually don't have categories. We, 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 we would uh, immediately uh, meet uh, a lack of principles. Um, think of revenge porn. Uh, you, may, you may have heard about this, this very problematic practice that is happening. The, it's, it's, the proper term for it would be non-disclosure dissemination of intimate contents. Basically, it's when some, somebody is sharing the, uh, a, a naked picture of somebody else without uh, his or, or the, them consent, their consent. And um, uh, it took so long <laughs> to the legal community to start acknowledging the concept of uh, actual, uh, actually the intimate material, the idea that uh, a photo, a video can actually be not only just uh, a good that you trade and exchange, uh, an inter a source of entertainment, but it can also be a mean of sexual expression of an individual. Um, and actually sexual expression is another principle that is not really clear in the, in the, in the legal world. Think of, uh, of that, think of the gender expression. I mean, it's a huge topic right now. And, and there, there are, of course, uh, everybody should have the freedom to express themselves. There is the right to self-determination that appears here and there in, uh, uh, everywhere, uh, uh, especially in the um, Western um, judicial uh, uh, cultures, but um, we don't really have a legal theory that encompasses all the aspects of what we could understand as gender expression. And so this, is, this makes it even more uh, difficult. And, of course, uh, as if this was not enough already, there is also a, a serious lack of political will to tackle these problems, to, to tackle the legal vac vacuum, especially in the pornographic uh, sphere, online pornography, but also in the digital world in general. Right now, this last part that I just said is changing because of, of course, how catchy the, the, all the digital topics are. But imagine, uh, again, put yourself in the lawmaker's dress, right, in, 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 the, in their shoes, and try to imagine going to your electoral uh, base, to, 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 to people that support you, and say that, Tomorrow you want to dedicate your work and your time in protecting the right of, uh, I don't know, uh, on, online porno, porno models or uh, people who want to <laughs> just access these porno, uh, porn platforms, right? It's, it's not uh, exactly the most appealing thing um, given also the cultural taboo. We will get uh, back on it very, very, very soon. Um, so um, questions like, uh, I don't know, like, uh, is it convenient for a, a political figure to address the kind of topics can actually be a slippery slope. And at least for sure, it's one of the main problems that is uh, making the filling up of this vacuum very, very difficult. And now uh, you see uh, at the bottom of this slide, I, I, I'm quoting Ludwig van der Rohe, the, the famous architect, uh, with his uh, very famous uh, sentence, less is more, because we may think that actually, um, sorry, we may think that actually less rules, less norms, especially, I guess, the most uh, libertarians and anarchist people in, 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 the, 
in the room today may probably agree with this. Uh, not always too many rules means less problems. Um, but is it, is, it, is it the case for us right now? So let's talk about the, the European context. Again, this is probably a bit far away from, I don't know, is there any person from Europe or is there is not from the US in the room? Oh, okay. Hey. <laughs> Okay, so, um, but don't worry, American friends. <laughs> this, this can actually be a huge, pro an interesting perspective for you as well. Um, so, um, you see, I mentioned GDPR. You see it in the first line, General Data Protection Regulation. Um, this, this has been a huge thing for, for us in Europe, but not only for us, because the GDPR applies to any subject who is running business in the EU. So even if you're not a European citizen, but you want to run business in the EU, you still need to uh, take care of this uh, and, and, and be careful uh, not to violate this rule, also because the fines are very, very high. And um, this rule, this, this regulation specifically um, has the merit to have introduced a, a beautiful concept that uh, was uh, discussed for a very long time, but it took very long to appear in a legal text, which is the concept of privacy by design, uh, as opposed to privacy by default. So that at some point, um, Platforms had to realize that to ensure privacy of their users would not, uh, is, was not enough to just promise that they will do it. It's not enough to just say, don't worry, we will take care of it. You have to prove that the design of your platform, the cybersecurity measures that you put in place, the, 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 the whole architecture of your algorithms is actually uh, privacy oriented. That was a huge step forward for the data protection law community and it only happened four years ago, let's say six, because the regulation was approved in 2016, but uh, still, it's, I mean, <laughs> computers have been around for a bit longer than that. Um, again, uh, going back in time, we have the privacy, e-privacy directly, the privacy and electronic com uh, commerce directive that you see since 2022. Um, that was actually also very important because it introduced concepts like data retention, uh, the, the, the limits to data retentions, and also was one of the first attempts in Europe to uh, regulate cookies. That was a, it was a huge topic uh, back then, it is still now. And, uh, or also the e-commerce directive. The e-commerce directive has the merit of uh, introducing one of the first attempts to categorize digital platforms. In the text of the norm, they are called intermediary service providers or, or uh, ISP, uh, also called Internet Service Providers, if you like. And they uh, introduced a brilliant idea of uh, dividing them in three categories. Three categories. Um, one, uh, well, not that it matters, but one is uh, mere conduit, one is a uh, cash provider, and one is hosting provider. Funny thing about this categorization is that eventually uh, the last one, the, the hosting provider category, uh, have become the, the, the main one, and which is good for, 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 for many reasons, because um, it's actually a, a gradual um, increase of norms and regulation coming from the first one that I mentioned, the mayor conduit, uh, uh, going through the cash, and then the hosting providers. So hosting providers have to abide to more rules than the others that I've mentioned. And right now, maybe some of you have heard about it, uh, the Digital Service Act and the Digital Market Act in Europe, these the two, two uh, new uh, regulations that are about to be uh, put in place in a couple of years, hopefully, um, will also uh, implement even more this concept. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you some very basic, uh, not even legal tools, but just uh, juridical uh, uh, ideas to play with uh, the, uh, because right now uh, we will start now uh, diving into the, any possible legal solutions or at least a legally informed perspective to this pornographic uh, word, the, the online pornography word that we're trying to understand a little bit better. So, legally speaking, what about porn platforms? Um, the first sentence that I decided to mention here in the, in the slide is from uh, Potter Stewart, uh, American uh, legal scholar, judge, and a lawyer. Um, well, this, this sentence is out of context, but uh, it, it was during the trial. He was trying to uh, express uh, what, um, what a 
pornographic content is, what a, what a porn, porn material is. I'm sorry for the loss in translations. We are not uh, English native speakers, so sometimes I can get clumsy. Anyhow, he was talking about this uh, pornographic image, and he said, I shall not today attempt further to define the kind of, this kind of material, but I know when I see it. So you see, when he used this sentence, well, it was long ago, I think in the 60s or even late 50s. Anyhow, when he used this sentence, um, he gave the perfect example of what's the difficulty of uh, wanting to talk about something that we can't even define. And even more than that, we don't dare to define because of the cultural taboo. Again, we will get to it. Just trying to plant a seed right now. <laughs> uh, but yeah. We still have this problem nowadays. It's, it's still a, a, a way to, to, to giggle, to, to, to think that it's uh, a bit of a, um, a naughty thing to talk about pornography, right? Even though it's in the everyday life of uh, the majority of the people we know, especially the, youngest, uh, the, the younger generations. And, uh, and we can already see the, 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 the consequences of that. So uh, the idea is to, uh, the, 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 the reason why I decided to, to start with this uh, quote, uh, quote is because I think that it, there is a clear mistake that we should uh, surpass. Uh, we should try to dare and define what we're talking about uh, when we talk about porn. Um, producing, selling, and possessing porno is still illegal in many nations. This is funny, right? Because it uh, raises a question. Uh, when we want to uh, find legal solutions or any kind of solutions to the pornographic world, uh, we still have to worry if, uh, I mean, is this a first world problem? <laughs> you know, if, if, if you allow me this clearly uh, joking uh, expression. Um, I don't think so. But in a certain sense it is. Uh, for sure, uh, when we when we look at the at the at the data, when we look at the at the map of the globe, we see that uh, porno is illegal in most of the countries that don't belong to the Western bloc, the Western quarter of the, of the of the planet. Uh, nevertheless, we can't deny that the industry affects the whole planet, especially considering that many of the actors. Uh, voluntary or involuntary actors that end up on these platforms come especially from the other parts of the world. So, um, so the problem is global, but there is probably a clear power dynamic going on. This is uh, also a way for us to be a bit more aware of uh, the, the coloni colonial <laughs> implications of, of yet another part of the world and of the digital world. And um, there has been a significant effort to stop child pornography and non-consensual pornography. So the reason why I mentioned that here in the, in the third point is because um, after making you feel guilty and making you feel a bit worried probably about how big this, uh, this issue is, how, how big the problem that we're trying to solve is, um, there are actually already some very uh, relevant and actually uh, uh, effective solution in place. They are all very uh, narrow in their focus given the, 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 the huge dimension of the problem uh, at hand. Uh, but yet, they, 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 they are, they're focused and partial uh, to this specific topic, but yet very important. Think, as I, I was mentioning, non-consensual pornography, but child pornography is also very obvious. In these cases, uh, of course, um, it's easier for a lawmaker to imagine a solution. First off, because creativity, apparently they say, works better when it's limited in a specific context. And also because it's not only the uh, sexual expression of those who make porn, porno or uh, consume porno, but it's also uh, uh, a matter of protecting the rights of other people that may get hurt in the transaction, in, the, in, in, in this, in this uh, dynamic. So what we can see, uh, we can see uh, a growing effort uh, in preventing underage users to access online pornography. This is, a, this is another thing that, uh, for instance, right now in the UK, well, right now, a couple of years back started, maybe a little bit more, uh, but also in other places of the world, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a topic that it's interesting because, it, I mean, um, 
Of course, of course, we 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 want to to imagine a, a, a safer way to 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 protect the the underage, the most sensitive people, those who are still maturing and creating their own uh, their own uh, sexual uh, uh, persona uh, from uh, an unlimited and a, a reckless access to these sometimes even. Uh, difficult to, to digest and to understand the kind of contents. But on the other hand, think of the solutions that have come out uh, when thinking of how to prevent underage users to access online pornography. The idea of requiring an ID when you connect on the internet, that's, that's, that's even worse. <laughs> I mean, uh, of course, the, 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 the problem of uh, uh, minors watching porns can be very um, upsetting, but we always have to be careful when we think of solving a problem not to solve it with an even bigger problem, right? Because I don't think that anybody here would be happy with a, a computer that asks you to show your driver's license before you log into whatever you want to log into that day. And yeah, an interesting debate has also sparked over the addictive nature of mainstream pornography content. That's also very interesting and, 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 and recent. And again, talking about solutions, um, well, imagine a world <laughs> where, like for cigarettes, or, well, usually in, a, I mean, some of these, uh, cigarettes is a good example, actually. Imagine a world where, where, where you have to show a banner that says, porn is addictive every time you access uh, uh, any video or any content that may involve uh, explicit uh, display of a, of a human body, sexual display of human body. Uh, that, that, that's, a, that's another kind of solution that can be, that's, that's a world we don't live in, <laughs> that we can imagine. And, um, but then again, it's, uh, it, it can also be, uh, give, uh, specifically when recognizing the addictive nature of this, uh, of this uh, kind of contents, it can also be yet another way to, to to create uh, dystopian and creepy uh, solutions. Think of all those who just would like to ban pornography altogether from the internet because it's obscene, because it's wrong, because it's not, uh, it's not clean, it's dirty, right? And, and so people would just like to suppress that and think of all the people that work in the industry and maybe have this as the only source of income. Think of all the people that just like to do it. Can we really make that illegal? This is a question that I'm raising because we will carry it with us to the next part and the final part of this uh, conversation that we're having today. By the way, in case you want to interrupt, ask questions, I don't know, raise a point, feel free that there is a microphone over there, you can just raise your hand, interrupt me whenever you want. And uh, just to, I, I was just checking the vibe, okay. <laughs> Some open issues. Of course, there are the, 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 the issues that I just described are actually issues where I could, if you want, later on, because we don't have time right now, point you some solutions somewhere in the world where legal people or lawmakers are trying to tackle these issues. But there are still some other open issues, such as, this of course is not a complete list, sex worker and prostitutes' rights. We still have to remember that Talk, uh, again, talking about Pornhub, for instance, it's very recent, their decision to remove from their platform all the non-consensual material that was still there. And think of all the people that ended up without their will because they were unaware of it, or also those who were forced to end up there. What's, what's with these people? What's, what's with the sex workers? Uh, of course, uh, it, it, this is yet another huge topic, uh, and we don't, we, when we think about the rights of sex workers, we always have to remember, in my opinion, that uh, most of them work mainly online nowadays. Um, what about the privacy, both of, of these workers and the users? Uh, specifically, this topic is, uh, is very dear to me, uh, also given the research that uh, we have conducted with Tracking Exposed that Julia was telling you about earlier on. Um, th there, is, there is a lot of data going on in this market. I mean, uh, this raises many questions. For instance, is uh, my search history on a porn platform a sensitive data? That's, that's a question, but it sounds very legal like this. I can also rephrase it in a different way. Would you share your search history on your favorite porn platform with, a, with a, a friend or an acquaintance or anybody? Or would you actually think that that's, um, that's part of your very intimate life? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you these questions not because I know the answer. Actually, I don't think that anybody can know an answer that fits for to, to all. But because we should start this conversation. 
we should try to ask ourselves. If we don't want uh, other people, uh, lawmakers, figure powers, uh, power figures to decide for us, we should start asking ourselves, what's the solution that I would like to see in the world? And what's the role of pornography in our society? That's, that's a question. I mean, is it just wrong? Uh, is, it, uh, is it maybe natural? Or uh, I don't know, is it uh, a business that it's still worth preserving? I don't know. These, these are all questions that we should ask ourselves a little bit more often, I think. Uh, also because, you see, when we, this is the final part of the presentation, by the way, when we, uh, when we think of solutions, when we try to uh, harvest, uh, do, do, do you want to ask a question? At some point. Sure. Oh, do you actually know about the uh, discoverability and retention period of uh, search logs in Port Hub's properties? Um, I mean, I, I know that, they're, that it's written in their privacy policy, but there is no way for us to know actually what's happening in their company's server. So I think it's four years. Okay. Was it the right answer? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, their transparency report mostly talks about their reports to the NCMEC and their content moderation policies hmm. and not their privacy policy, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I'm looking forward to see their transparency reports, especially when the DSA, the Digital Service Act, will come into force, because there is an article that will force uh, large online platforms to make yearly transparency reports, which, we, which not all of them do right now. And also, not only that, they will have to abide to very strict criteria. So it will not be your own made transparency report. It will be much more, uh, well, full of stuff, hopefully. We will see. Um, I don't know if I answered to your question. Well, I have a larger question. I, I fail to understand what your problem is with Pornhub's recommendation system and you know, what the expectations of Pornhub users are about what kinds of videos are suggested to them. You know, I, can, I built recommender systems and I can understand how they might be better at doing the heteronormative recommendations and categorization than doing the kinky side of the, the house because there's much less history, much less tagging, much less crowdsourced information and metadata about that kind of content. So it wouldn't be that easy for them to categorize hmm. people's kinks, you know, especially when they're, uh, you know, they might cluster in strange, you know, less traditional ways. So I'm not sure what your problem was with them to actually go back to the initial talk. I mean, I don't know if Julia wants to yeah. pick this one, yeah. Well, it's not just our problem. I mean, it's since the 80s, if feminism has uh, If you could always... take your mask off, it might ah, be sorry. better. <laughs> I forgot about that. Um, I mean, it's not just uh, our problem with that. But, um, it's a feminist problem since the 80s. There was, uh, there were the war on pornography. So the idea that uh, these uh, recommender systems can now radicalize people and uh, has, I mean, if you see that uh, um, Facebook or Instagram can uh, shape your reality, uh, why this platform shouldn't shape your sexuality? Because a lot of videos in Pornhub are abused are just, uh, I mean, is, is paid, uh, paid uh, prosti film, uh, filmed prostitution, so. Uh, so I'm sorry, are, uh, what, were your findings that people's sexuality was being steered in a way that was inappropriate or wrong We are not way? at that point yet because uh, there is a lot of work that has to be done first and to um, identify how this can affect the population um, is a, a sociological uh, problem. I mean, uh, can be a technical the solution of a social problem, no? Uh, if I may step in. Um, 
Besides the fact that the, 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 you, you, you are perfectly described in your own questions, uh, question the, the, the main problem of it, right? You said we have less, less data for this uh, out, uh, outskirt fringe of uh, sexualities and gender orientation, so our algorithms cannot be very uh, uh, at, like, as, as precise as for the, let's say, main, mainstream basic sexual yeah. orientations, right? And um, wouldn't it be already enough to ask ourselves if we uh, are fine with making these kind of algorithms? And just to answer your question, of, we don't have evidences of the actual change of sexual orientation or uh, any other uh, empirical uh, uh, measurement of the impact of this content recommendation. But if we want to keep it a bit more simple, it's quite intuitive. Uh, we can imagine that, um, especially a, a young person that is accessing a, a platform without knowing how the algorithm works, without knowing how the content is recommended to, the, to them, well, the, the, these, these, these young people will just you know, consume what they see and what they have. And what if the algorithm has decided that you are heterosexual or homosexual when actually inside of you, you are still forming a consciousness about it? What's gonna happen with you? And we could, we, we could still say that it's their fault because they decided to do that. They decided to access the platform. They decided to expose themselves to this influence of the algorithm. Uh, we could say that, or we could not, <laughs> and realize that this is still part <laughs> of, of, of a soci societal problem. This is still part of something that we should not turn our head away from. Uh, it sounds like no algorithm can do a satisfactory job given the absence of uh, expectations and norms. So I'm not sure. I, what, I think what, that many people would agree with you. I, 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 for one, would, and I don't know, could it be a reason to, to, to reimagine these algorithms to, I don't know, introduce a bit more of privacy by design or, uh, I don't know, respect by design? I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I managed to answer your questions, but we can continue afterwards. Thank you Actually, very much. Actually, so uh, that dovetails nicely into this online question. Traditionally, the porn industry has been the technology leader, pushing VHS over Betamax, DVD protocol selection, streaming technologies. Do you see them leading in solving this uh, bias algorithm? Problem? I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite grasp the... the... So the uh, porn, porn industry has traditionally been the leader in technology selection for, hmm. social, for, for our media formats. Um, do you see them being a leader in technology in building and solving this uh, bias issue. That, that, that was actually part of the final slides that I wanted to, to show. Uh, I, I will try to answer this question also. I don't know, I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, Five minutes? Okay, well, let's, let's try. Um, so yeah, because the question was about solutions and my final slides also, so <laughs> what a nice coincidence. <laughs> Um, as, 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 as you see here, um, possible approaches, possible solutions, I think that there are at least three. One is policy, one is advocacy, and one is litigation that I kept for last. Um, so policy, uh, currently most of the power and agency over this field is in the hands of the private sector, so in this case the, 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 the platforms themselves. And um, um, there are many projects to try and offer alternatives to mainstream online pornography, embedding values like feminism, not conformity of gender, sex workers empowerment, and more. Uh, these are all uh, interesting projects, uh, still niche, still uh, smaller than the mainstream platforms. And, um, and the problem is that the public, or at least for what we have seen, is that the public opinion does not seem to see this issue as a priority, also to this cultural taboo. So, again, we are, uh, as I said before, we should always remember that we are not talking about an emergency in the sense of a priority that we have to address. We can also decide altogether as a society or individually speaking just to ignore it but we've seen all the monsters that are coming out of this problem if we don't tackle it. We have seen what happens when we don't uh, care about the safety of those who are exposed in these videos. If you look at all the hate that there is online against, uh, well, women <laughs> in, uh, in most of the times uh, when they try to, to, to express themselves, to show uh, uh, their body, or also to all the non uh, heteronormative uh, orientations. Whenever they show themselves online, um, there is 
uh, hatred, there is a tension. And this could also be part of the consequences of this huge communication machine, these algorithms that we try to build as good as we can apparently, uh, that still only reiterate the same models uh, over and over again in an incredibly loud uh, Way. Some extremists would even call it, I don't know, means of uh, uh, dissemination of rape culture, but not me. Um, another solution could be advocacy. Advocacy is, um, of course, a way to go to institutions and ask for, uh, for, for them to solve the problems. And uh, this topic is often not welcome by these political institutions. Uh, pushing for openness on these issues may escalate in a moral panic as I said, because on one end you have people that are trying to climb this mountain of the cultural taboo, and on the other end you have people that want to push them and actually stop it altogether from, uh, from the start. And, and, and uh, a blind fight against obscenity and other forms of extremism generates a toxi toxic debate. It's always very difficult to actually talk about these things because sex has always been an incredibly powerful uh, core element of our cultures, of our societies, or of our history. And so it's not going to be easy. Um, oh, and sorry, I forgot to mention, you see that there is in a, yeah, up, up left reactive and proactive, the policy and advocacy solution can be both reactive, so you use them after there is a problem, or proactive, you can actually decide to try and prevent problems from, happenings, from happening. Uh, and then there's litigation, which is of course, only reactive. When somebody violates a norm, you can try and, and you know, make them accountable for that. And it seems to be the most reachable approach at the, at the present time is the low-hanging fruit, at least for, for our experience, allows to bring together law and technology um, specialists. So yeah, law exp legal experts and IT specialists uh, can have very interesting conversations uh, about, uh, about many things, apparently, with this. Um, and involves judges, data protection authorities, and so uh, somehow uh, closes the gap between people and institutions also in this, and sets very important judicial precedents. But what about you, if we still have time to talk about it? Do, are you aware of any issue? What would you like to investigate? How? Which methodology would you use? If you see any problem in the first place, but I'm, I don't know. Um, if you do, and, and, and you would like to, to, the, the, to discuss it with us, we'll be more than happy to, 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 to know what you think. Uh, you can, uh, again, find a, a lot of material from our project on, on our website, uh, Tracking Exposed. Uh, Tracking.exposed is the main website. The, for the Pornhub project, is pornhub.tracking.exposed. Uh, you can find uh, even the slides we just used uh, today and uh, um, an academic paper that has been recently published about the analysis of the algorithm that were conducted from uh, using the tools that uh, Julia just uh, presented to you. And that was it. Thank you very much. And I hope you had a good time. Julia, Alex, thank you so much. They'll be available outside if you have questions.